Hey, good morning and welcome to Euro Nurse. We meet every Saturday at 9 a.m. Central Time. If you're watching this on YouTube, great. Uh, be sure to hit that like button and that subscribe button. And as of last week, we started to be over Facebook too. So there's the like, share, and follow on Facebook that you can utilize. Uh, welcome to all of our viewers. If this is your first time checking us out on Euro Nurse, be sure to check out our website at euronurse.com where you can find out more about us and what uh, how you can become part of the audience and how you can share in all this. Uh, it's also the best place to see all of our past videos and we have a bunch of them up there. For a matter of fact, we've got 32 episodes. This will be episode 33 for us. So we're really coming along with lots of episodes. I'd like to thank our supporters that have helped uh, sponsor this program. If you're interested in sponsoring the program, hit that sponsor info button on the screen there on the website, and you'll be able to get more information. Now, since we are streaming over uh, YouTube, Facebook, and StreamYard, uh, the same way to communicate through all medias. So you can just use the comment uh, box and send any of your questions to us. We always start off the show with some general questions. And once we uh, get through our general questions, then we go into our main show. Today, we got a great one for you. This week, Dr. Ike Ouija 4 is going to be joining us. And he's going to be talking about robotic cystectomy. So we're looking forward to that. And so let's go ahead and meet our panelists right now that we have on with us today. I'm going to bring them all into view here. Uh, for those of you that are new to the show, my name is Vic Sinise. I'm the host of the show, and I've been in urology for 30-plus years. I quit counting after 30, but it's been a long time and really an enjoyable career. This is my way of giving back. Uh, going in order, Andrea, why don't you go ahead and give your introduction? Hi, my name is Andrea Strong. I'm a nurse practitioner. I work in Wisconsin. I've been working in urology as a nurse or nurse practitioner since 2010. I've done inpatient, outpatient. I'm also certified as a urology registered nurse. Thanks. Great. And Dr. Ike, why don't you go ahead and let us know what you do? Hey, I'm Dr. Ike Aguija Four. Uh, I'm a one of the partners at. Uh, Associated Urological Specialist in Chicago Ridge, uh, Oakland. Uh, I specialize in robotic surgery, endourology, and uh, stone disease, and also oncology. All right, great. Great to have you with us today. So we're going to go in to our uh, favorite story section, and uh, I'm going to kick it off. I don't think we have a lot of us with favorite stories, but I've got one I think that really fits the, the bill for today. Um, so my favorite story is is basically what I, I call um, a good way to get patients to relax for a procedure. And that's just what I, we call distraction therapy. So uh, one of the things I always do is, and, I, and I, most of what I'm involved in right now is prostate biopsies. So getting patients ready for it, assisting with it, and the whole procedure, I'm there. So I always start by having some music playing. Music's a great distraction. And I, most of the patients now coming in are kind of my age, so we pick the same songs. So this, what I've got playing, they'll always start talking about, oh, I know that band, and I remember this. It gets us chit-chatting. I always look and see what they're wearing, because they have logo wear on, like the Bears, the Bulls, the Cubs. Who supports the Cubs? Anyway, if you have logo wear on, you know, we'll talk about teams and stuff like that. And then... Uh, this is what he has to do with Dr. Ike because he'll come into the room ready to, to start the procedure. You know, patients, like I said, they're always nervous and they can't see what's going on because they're not facing where they can see. And he and I will always go into some kind of crazy banter, whether we're talking about technology, politics, uh, you know, just the weather, what's eco economics, whatever the, the we decide to talk about. We'll just get chatting at it. And some patients will join in, most will just kind of listening. And the thing is, that's where it's key. They start to listen and they pay attention to us and not what we're doing. And I'll tell you, it's surprising how many patients will get up and say, wow, you know, this, I was so nervous and this really was nothing. Um, and, you know, I've had a few of them actually call me out on it and they'll say, you know what? I know exactly what you guys were doing. <laughs> so we got to keep doing it because it works. It's really yeah. a good, a good uh way to get get patients into a better mood um, any questions from the audience feel free to submit those into the comments we'll grab any questions that you have if not we're gonna just move along into our show um, I don't see any so I'm gonna head and go ahead and bring you up to on the screen here Ike so you can switch over to your okay 
slideshow. I'm going to show that. All right. You can see me. So let's see. You still have to change that to full view. Okay. The, the little screen on the bottom. Um, this one here. Yeah. Uh, nope, it's to the. It's, you're close to it. It's it's this one. That's it. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, robot assisted uh, or robot assisted laparoscopic ra uh, radical cystectomy. Uh, basically, you know, for I know this is a medical audience, uh, but uh, a cystectomy involves uh, removal of the bladder and also the all the other organs that are around the bladder, um, including the lymph nodes. And uh, after you remove the bladder and the lymph nodes, you also have to do what is called a urinary diversion, which is find a way to reconnect uh, the urine that is made from the kidney uh, down the ureters will still have to come out uh, in some way or fashion. Um, and who is a candidate for this? Uh, well, a uh, candidate is somebody who is being treated uh, for uh, bladder cancer. And uh, usually the indication is for patients who have muscle invasive bladder cancer. Um, and, you know, as you all know, bladder cancer goes from uh, non-muscle invasive to uh, metastatic disease. Uh, but usually uh, a cystectomy is reserved uh, for uh, patients who you are trying to uh, basically get local control of the disease and by removing uh, the bladder. Um, so those patients who you deem, uh, adequate enough uh, to undergo cystectomy are the ones, uh, I usually, you know, will offer the, the procedure to. And, uh, um, <clears throat> now the, uh, standard of care is, is to do neoadjuvant chemo, uh, before you actually proceed, uh, with doing cystectomy. Um, so... Radical cystectomy treatment of, of choice uh, when it's non-metastatic muscle invasive disease. So the cancer hasn't spread beyond the bladder anywhere you can see. Um, and uh, after that, give chemotherapy. After chemotherapy, then talk about removing the bladder. Uh, you can still do cystectomy uh, in some instances. Um, <clears throat> uh, for example, uh, when a patient has a very large tumor burden, but it's you know, you, you can't prove that is uh, muscle invasive, or in some cases, patients who have locally advanced disease, um, and in some patients who actually respond, uh, you know, they may have metastatic disease, but you know, after they get chemotherapy, they respond well, and you want to consolidate treatment. You can still do uh, a cystectomy in those cases. Uh, the ways to do cystectomy, uh, you could do it open, you could do laparoscopic, or you can do it uh, robot-assisted. Um, I I would say for the last uh, 13 years now, 14 years, I have done them strictly uh, robotically. And uh, in, in doing it robotically, what you're doing is basically putting in laparoscopic ports and then using the DaVinci uh, robot system. Uh, a lot of the... My talk is basically a, a bunch of pictures and, I, you know, uh, Vic or Andrea, you guys can, you know, pause at any time or anybody else can ask a question and, and, and I can explain. It's easier to talk about it by, you know, talking about the, the uh, using pictures. Um, like you can see here, uh, the camera port is usually at the 12 o'clock position and then there are other smaller uh, eight port, uh, which are the uh, red circle, the open circles. Um, and then a five millimeter port is for an assistant as well as a 12 millimeter port. And that's for uh, uh, an assistant to bring in instruments. And you will actually see when I show you pictures of, of how these ports come into, uh, into use. Um, so to understand the DaVinci system, uh, there's the, the platform, there's the surgical console where, you know, there's the, the, the uh, console where the surgeon sits on. Uh, there's the patient cart and then the vision cart. So the way this works is the patient cart is what basically is connected to the ports that you saw on the previous slide. And then the surgeon and sits on the console to control the patient cart. All the, that information is um, managed and uh, controlled using the vision cart. 
So it's a system that removes the surgeon from the bedside. And in terms of you know doing surgery, you're basically doing the surgery sitting down here uh, uh, and looking through the surgeon console and then uh, operating the patient cart uh, to do surgery. And, you know, kind of what it looks like is, you know, here's a surgeon sitting here he's with the fingers uh, in the uh, uh, surgeon console and moving the instruments while he looks uh, through uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the IP view of the surgeon console. So how is robotic different? Uh, robotic surgery uh, different from laparoscopic surgery. The biggest difference is uh, the degrees of motion that you can get with the instruments. In a standard laparoscopy instrument, just you know what I tell my residents is I think of it as you're operating with chopsticks. You can you can go up, down, in and out, and you know and a little bit of sideways. That's pretty much what you can do with a uh, laparoscopic instrument, as you can see from the slide on the left side. Now, with a robotic instrument, you have a lot more degrees of freedom. And, you know, you can go in, out, rotate the shaft, go, you know, pitch, yaw, both externally and internally, and you can do that at the wrist. So this basically, uh, what the robot does is that it gives the surgeon back his hand. It's as if the, the, the hand is back inside of the patient and you're using it you know, to, to do surgery because you can almost move it in any direction you want. Um, now, these uh, surgical uh, atlases, is, this is where I got a lot of the pictures that I'll be showing you guys to kind of describe, uh, describe the procedure. I figured that using... Um, illustrations is better than just trying to explain it. Um, so uh, for reference uh, and uh, for credit, this is uh, the area where uh, the atlas where I got my pictures from. So the first stage, stage of the procedure usually is to identify the ureter um, when you start. Uh, and the ureter, as you can see on the first image on the left side, uh, you, we find it where it crosses the pelvic brim. And this will be here. The uh, Internal, the common iliac artery heading towards the external iliac artery. And then the robotic instruments, as well as the sucker, is used. We, you identify the artery, oh, sorry, not the artery, the uh, ureter, and then place a clip at the tip of the ureter. Do that on both sides. And then afterwards, uh, the next step is to basically um, <clears throat> mobilize the posterior base off the uh, uh, bladder. And by doing this, it's called doing your posterior dissection. So you're basically uh, peeling off the bladder from the rectum. And in this, uh, this picture will be in the man because obviously there is no picture of the uh, uh, ovaries or the uterus or any other female organs here. So once you complete this dissection, you, and I do this this way too, uh, after getting the ureters on both sides, you, you, do the posterior dissection to try to release the the all the posterior uh, attachments of the rectum from the bottom part of the bladder, the seminal vesicles, uh, as well as the prostate, and you go as as anterior as, as not anterior but as distal as you can. Um, the one thing about robotic surgery that is very very different from open surgery is that when we do this open, we do this practically blind. We just basically put our hands in there. We get that window, we put our hands in there, and we just kind of work it all the way up and hopefully get to the right place. Well, with robotic surgery, everything is done on the vision. You you see every single thing that you're doing. You can't do anything without seeing it. Um, then after that's done, um, with the bladder still attached, the next goal is uh, basically to do the, the uh, lateral dissection and open up the pedicles and also start the lymph node the lymph node dissection. Um, so in this case, uh, it's, it is being done on the right side and then later on the left side. Um, this will be the psoas muscle. Uh, this will be the, the uh, iliac uh, vessels and the lymph nodes that are taken uh, basically start from the genital femoral nerve. This will be the genital femoral nerve running on top of the uh, psoas muscle heading towards the inguinal canal. And you will take all the lymph node packet that is surrounding 
these vessels all the way up to the common iliac standard. Um, I usually go all the way up to the aortic bifurcation. Um, and you will go all, also down uh, towards the obturator, um, obturator vessels. So everybody kind of does this slightly different. I usually will remove uh, the lymph nodes. Uh, I will actually free up the bladder first and then uh, remove the entire bladder before I start doing lymph nodes. In this series, what they describe is kind of like how I was trained too, which is uh, to do the lymph nodes first and afterwards then remove the bladder. Um, so in this scenario, they're basically just con continuing the, uh, the uh, lymph node dissection, um, kind of showing, uh, so th this would be the uh, internal, uh, sorry, the external iliac artery. This will be the, where the common iliac is. This is the external iliac vein on the left side and all this lymph node. So the lymph node packets, I always get the question from residents like, oh, how do you know which one is the lymph node? Basically what you're taking is all the fatty tissue that is all around those vessels and you're skeletonizing everything from beginning to end. So that when you're done, what you have is a picture that looks like this, where, you know, initially, if you remember when we started, um, these vessels were not looking like this. Now they're looking basically all exposed and all shiny because every single lymphatic tissue around them has been released. So this will be the common iliac artery here. This is the internal iliac, internal iliac artery. This will be external iliac artery. This would be the external iliac vein. And then once the lymph node dissection is, is completed, uh, then you will start taking the pedicles of the bladder and start releasing the bladder. So that's, you know, the pedicles are being taken here. And then uh, the, <clears throat> the uh, dissection is now carried anteriorly to drop the bladder uh, on, on this uh, side. And... Once you've uh, taken that, then the, the uh, dorsal venous complex is this here, and this can bleed, trust me. Um, that's the reason why this is oversewn. Uh, usually it is cut blind, uh, not blind, but it's cut without electricity. Uh, sometimes you, I ligate it before I cut it. Um, some people just cut it and then you know, uh, ligate it afterwards. But... Uh, Pneumoperitoneum does wonders because when you cut this uh, dorsal venous uh, complex, what you will find is that you just turn up pneumo to like 20. And even though this big blood vessel is wide open, it will not bleed, which, you know, kind of goes to the, the advantages of robotic surgery. One of the biggest advantages of robotic surgery is that the amount of fluid shift that we used to see on patients that we did cystectomies on, we didn't see when you do robotic surgery, because the patient is not open and, you know, you're not having insensible, you know, fluid loss into the environment, um, we don't see those fluid shifts. And the amount of bleeding that we normally get is also something that, you know, uh, we don't get. I mean, open, this surgery can, people can lose, you know, anywhere from 500 cc's to sometimes, you know, a liter. Uh, but robotic, um, you in my opinion, I, I call it like you barely lose blood. The only thing that you actually see is a lot of lymphatic drainage. Um, so this is continuing with the, the complete dissection. And so the, to complete the dissection in the male, uh, in this stage, you've, you've done all the uh, lymph node dissection. Uh, you've taken the dorsal venous complex, and then you're clipping the last of the pedicles. Uh, and then the only thing left is the urethra. Now, remember... The bladder has urine in it, and you do not want the contents of the bladder to spill out uh, into the surgical field. So before you cut the urethra, you actually ligate the, the urethra with, with um, I hear they use the wet clip. I usually will tie it off. Uh, actually, I do both. I'll tie it off and also put a wet clip before I cut it open. So at this point, uh, the uh, cystectomy is done meaning the removal of the bladder and the lymph nodes are done. Uh, now, in the female, it is, it's different because in a female, as you can tell from anatomy days, the anterior vaginal wall is also part of the base of the bladder. So in a female, what we do is that we put a sponge stick or some type of instrument in the vaginal canal to basically distend the vaginal canal and... When we do the posterior dissection in this scenario, we'll be incising the lateral wall of the, of the vagina and basically 
taking, so when we do uh, a cystectomy in a female, we take both the ovaries and uh, the uterus and uh, a uterus cervix and anterior wall of the, of the, vi of, of the vagina is also taken out. Uh, what, in what is, you know, what will be uh, uh, called uh, anterior exenteration, basically. Uh, so after you're done, um, you will then have a hole um, where now the posterior vaginal wall is used uh, to flip over and, and basically close. So this here will be the sponge stick that is in the vaginal canal. And then you would uh, kind of free up uh, the posterior vaginal wall, some portions of it, and use it to uh, close the defect. Um, for me thus far, I haven't done uh, um, uh, vaginal sparing uh, uh, cystectomy. Um, because it's one is very difficult, and then two is that you have to kind of do it on the right patient. Um, you know, patients that don't have any cancer close to their bladder neck. They are, if you're trying to spare the urethra and use it, you know, for a new bladder or something like that. Um, so it's uh, in my in my experience, I've basically every cystectomy in a female that I've done, I usually will remove uh, uh, the anterior vaginal wall. And the downside of that is that it does shorten uh, the, the vagina basically after the procedure because you've taken out at least a good two-thirds of the vagina. So after you're done, it will be a very uh, short vaginal canal. Now, moving on to the urinary diversion, uh, this is uh, doing the... I usually do an ileocondroid. I've done some neobladders, uh, but that ileocondroid is easy to uh, describe. Uh, um, a neobladder has more steps and is a more complicated um uh, but it, an ileocondroid is uh simpler the thing with an ileocondroid is that you are basically taking a small segment of bowel of a small intestine which is uh, uh, from the terminal ileum we measure out um so this will be the on the right side of the screen here it will be the ileocecal valve okay from the ileocecal valve we measure out about uh 15 uh, uh, centimeters, and then from there is where we start now uh, measuring our bowel to use for the ileocondroid segment. So <clears throat> as you can tell, working with bowel is challenging, uh, but because of the articulation of the robotic instruments, we're able to do that. Um, so, and the reason you preserve this portion of the, of, uh, the uh, uh, ileum is because this is important for a uh, vitamin uh, 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 B12 uh, um, absorption, and it's kind of necessary for digestion too. So we, once you mark out that 15 to 20 centimeters, I usually start around 15 to 20, and then from there you you measure backwards and and then uh, measure what length of uh, conduit that you want. I usually use about 10 centimeters uh, of bow. You, you tack up um, the, the terminal, uh, sorry, your, what, will, what will be your, um, let me call this the, your, what, what will end up being your, your conduit, the, the, the stoma, you tack up that end to the skin, and then the other end, your robotic arm brings up. The other thing that's important is that your ureter from the left side um, is usually, we cross it over under the sigmoid to the right side, because we have to anastomose both the ureters to the bowel segment. So I, in this picture, the, so remember we, we tacked it up to the body wall and then the other robotic arm is holding uh, the other portion of the valve. Then the mesentery is <clears throat> opened. And the goal here is to preserve the blood supply that goes to this segment of bowel. You want to preserve it as much as possible. So we make an incision running parallel to the blood supply, heading towards the root of the mesentery on both sides, and then afterwards divide the bowel, as they did here, and then now you have your isolated loop of bowel that you're going to use for the ileoconduit. Then the two cut ends are basically, you tag them like this so you don't forget, um, and then flush the conduit. So... Previously, when I did open surgery, uh, we would have patients do bowel prep where they would, you know, take go lightly and basically show up to the hospital pooping clear. Um, now I don't do that anymore. What I tell patients to do is, you know, two to three days before surgery, uh, clear liquid diet, 
and uh, they stay on liquids. And uh, and what I've found during surgery is that when we do uh, irrigate the, the loop of intestine that we use, if they actually did uh, stay with the uh, liquid diet, um, we actually don't have a lot of fecal matter here. We actually can irrigate this with a, with a, a Foley catheter and a suction, and uh, it clears up very quickly. Um, now, where I differ in this uh, picture is that I actually will reanastomose this bowel first before I start doing the conduit uh, uh, surgery. Um, so because the last thing you want is to finish surgery, do the ileoconduit, and then forget to uh, hook the, the bowel continuity, reestablish continuity between the bowel. So, but, you know, for illustration purposes, we follow the picture. Um, so after you open, you irrigate the bowel clear, we anastomose the ureter. So this is the right ureter, gets anastomose to the butt end of uh, the conduit. And then the left ureter uh, is also done on the other side. And I usually do this in a running water type fashion. And uh, after that's done, uh, you then put a stent in. And that stent is actually brought into by the uh, patient uh, assistant uh, uh, from the patient assistant port and then tread it all the way up into the kidney and then brought out through the skin. So you do this on this here, they did it on the right side. And then afterwards, you do the same thing on the left side. So this is completion of the right anastomosis. After it's done, then the left side will be done. And then here we start working on re-establishing the, um, uh, the flow of the bile by reconnecting the proximal segment to the distal segment. And again, as you can see, all these are done robotically with robotic instruments. Um, and you, what I call this is making a very big donut. You kind of make a big uh, donut between the two. You make a small, so in this picture, you make a small uh, opening in both ends of the bowel. Remember, we, we put them together here. And then you make a small opening on the anti-mesenteric portion and then put uh, a, a bowel stapler in between the two and then kind of staple them shut. Hence, connecting this tubular structure to this tubular structure. And then afterwards, the top opening here, you put another stapler here to kind of close it off. And now when you're done, you have the bowel reconnected, flowing from this direction to this direction. And then after you're done, now you have your uh, ileo conduit completed with its mesentery and the stents are in. And then you basically tread this through a hole uh, from one of the, usually it's the port, one of the uh, ports that we use for surgery gets converted to our ostomy site and then you bring it, bring it out to the skin. So that's uh, my presentation. Any questions? So I'm just going to bring us all back on screen here. Um, I do have some questions coming in from the audience and now is the time that if you have a question, feel free to submit those. Um, let's go ahead and bring up this first one. Katie Bortel asks, who is a candidate for robotic cystectomy and have you ever had the change to open procedures? Uh, so a candidate for robotic cystic, it's a, in my book, is somebody who is healthy, has a good performance status, um, can tolerate surgery, hopefully um, not um, medically, uh, you know, somebody whose heart and lungs can tolerate being in Trendelenburg position for a very long time. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and also uh, uh, somebody who does not have uh, any uh, uh, major uh, bowel uh, issues. Okay. Have you ever had to uh, convert from uh, robotic to open procedure? Uh, no. It's fascinating um, just to, to hear the talk on this because I'm really, I know what it's about, but I've never gone through the whole procedure like you were able to kind of dissect it. And it's uh, pretty impressive that you can do all that with a robot. Uh, so the, the biggest advantage of the robot is that, you know, it gives you back, you know, like your hands in the sense that the, the things you could do open, you can now do it like, you know, you kind of think of it like you're operating under the hood, but you still are able to kind of, you know, do your feet, whatever, when you put your fingers in, in, in that, um, in the surgeon console, 
whatever you want to do, if you want to do this, you will do this with, with the instrument. Yeah. So it's, it, it's very, very intuitive and it just gives you back, you know, what you would have done open. Um, now there is a learning curve where, you know, you have to kind of rewire your brain to, uh, because there's no tactile feel, like you don't actually, yeah. you know, feel, everything is, you kind of feel it in your brain. That's what I explained to residents. It's, it's more like you're looking at it and you think if I touch that, I will know I'm holding it. No, it's your eyes is the only thing that tells you you're holding something. Yeah. Early on when I was, uh, um, before robotic was just kind of in its infancy, I was at the AUA and they had a, <clears throat> excuse me, a setup where you could go over there and play with the robot and tie stitches and things like that. Yeah. And it, so I was able to go and sit down and play with the robot for a while. And it is kind of interesting, as you say, there's no tactile, but the manipulations, I mean, you, it's a learning curve, but you can start getting to the point where you could actually tie a suture with the robot hands pretty quickly. It's yeah. Uh, yeah. kind of an amazing process. So I have a, a question that, coming in here uh what is the average time of robotic versus traditional surgery uh so okay so that depends on a surgeon experience to to start with um for somebody who does a lot of robotic surgery uh they average actually uh for a cystectomy i would say roughly about six to eight hours uh depending on you know how what takes the most time in cystectomy is the lymph node dissection and uh, doing the, the bowel reconstruction because mm -hmm. as you can tell you are trying to you know if you've ever worked with intestine you know like it does it doesn't stay anywhere it just wants to swish around so you have to kind of hold it, yeah, it the first the first few times you work with it is very difficult uh, but it, and that would extend your surgical time but once you've done it a couple of times and you know get a hang of it um, I would say, um, I would say about six hours um, now open, open, it would be about four to six. Now, the thing with open is that most urologists don't do cystectomy solo, meaning like they, they do it with another full fledged board certified urologist with robotic surgery. I'm doing this with a nurse, with an assistant, like. You know, basically, a search, you know, surgical assistant or scrub tech, or uh, that's who's in the room. And you know, I have the fortune of having residents, but only one in a, you know, as you can see in the robotic surgery, only one person can work at a time. So you don't actually get that expediency of doing things faster because there's only camera can only look in one direction at one time. When you're doing open surgery, you got two surgeons and they work in tandem, and you know, it's it's a lot faster. I'll tell you that. Yeah, it's still a long operation. When I first joined the group, um, in order to know what the surgeries were, they felt that it was important that I scrubbed in on all the cases that they did, their major yeah. cases. And most of them were kind of fun to sit through. Radical cystectomy was not a fun thing to be there for. <laughs> I was like, yeah. this is never going to end. It's just, yeah. uh, as you say, the bowel part was was crazy, yeah. just how long it took. There, that was the reason I, I chose to just use illustrations for the talk is because I think for a lot of nurses, you know, we, we hear the term, but we don't actually know what actually goes into into seeing it. And mm -hmm. when you see it, is this is a procedure that has a lot of steps. Like when I say steps, I mean a lot. I know I made a joke about like that, reconnecting the bowel. Um, you will not believe how by two, you know, after about seven hours of operation, you are, your brain is fatigued and you forget one simple step and that's a complication right there. So, yeah. um, it's, it's a very, very long surgery and very difficult surgery. Yeah. You'd mentioned in the female uh, side, the vagina is, is compromised or made yes. short and have patients been able to get back to normal sexual function. Well, my experience uh, in my series of patients, uh, those ladies were at that point not sexually active anymore. Mm -hmm. And even when I brought up uh, the topic, um, they were not really interested. Um, now, in a younger patient uh, who, you know, let's say somebody who's 55 and sexually active and they want to uh, retain uh, um, uh, the ability to have sex, what I would do is I would send them to my, you know, colleagues at the university who can do the, the vaginal sparing. Because the big, the big thing with vaginal sparing is that it has to be 
the the tumor has to be in the right place is one meaning like somewhere away from the urethra the bladder neck um, the base of the bladder um, ideally like on the lateral wall away from all these things that you're trying to spare so that you don't compromise oncologic outcome you know if you go in to spare the vagina but then you end up leaving cancer behind that's not good um, so it's I I cancel all my patients. I cancel them to say, hey, listen, um, when I do this, I would, I take everything out. Um, now, in men, when we do it, because we do nerve sparing uh, prostatectomies, when we do robotic surgery, we also do nerve sparing robotic uh, 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 cystoprostectomy. Uh, we actually do the same nerve sparing that we do in men, uh, for prostates. So you can still have men that, you know, would still retain erection. Um, if you know if uh, uh, that's something that's very important to them, but again, it all depends. And the one advantage advantage of robot, especially in bulky disease, is that you can sometimes you know when we did open, we feel so we can feel like where it's hard and things like that, and we decide oh we're not gonna be we have to be kind of wide in this area. We robot when you when you're looking, you you can actually see areas that don't look right. Um, and the way they, the way they feel too. I mean, even though you don't have that tactile feel having, when you move tissue, there's, there's a way that, you know, tissue will move and you know, it's moving normally. And there's a way it will move and you know, like this thing is not moving, it's stuck. And in that scenario, you kind of know, like they have something that is way worse and trying to do nerve sparing or any other, all that stuff is probably not worth it. And, you know, you take everything. Yeah. Thank you for that presentation. That was really great to see all the pictures. Um, I have a question actually about surgeon health. So it sounds like these surgeries are pretty long, six to eight hours. <laughs> I'm looking <laughs> at the console that you're sitting at. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking about ergonomics. Yeah. Um, can you speak to that? How is there an opportunity to adjust the equipment to fit? There, uh, there is. You can you can adjust the 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 visual part. So the head part where you actually put your head in uh, to look in, uh, in into the um, into the, the viewer um, is 3D and it can adjust. It can actually go uh, from this position to that position. Now, I'm a very tall guy. And what I'll tell you is that I've tried every single adjustment that there is. At the end of the days that I have robots, I would tell you that um, the next day, my body knows that we did something because the, the discomfort usually is in my neck area and my shoulders, um, as well as kind of low back sometimes. Um, the back one, I've, you know, we have different types of chairs that we can use for that. But um, in terms of ergonomics, I mean, it could be better. What I would, what would be great is if there's a way to free it up where we don't actually have to have our necks always like this in the visual cart, um, you know, like kind of looking in, you know, if something that you that comes to your face and you and you can move your face with it without you know needing you to strain your neck, looking in uh, the the entire time. Uh, the newer uh, generation of robots are better. Uh, I think right right now we're using the XI robot. When I started, we were using S robot. S robot was you can only change a few things. You can only change like the position of, you know, the, the handles. Um, the SI was better. It gave you a little bit more room inside. And then the XI, as you saw, I wish I put the pictures of them. The, the XI actually has more degrees of freedom for the instruments when you're moving them. With the other robots, there was a, you, know, you have to clutch a lot because the space that you moved in was not as wide. Like it's, it doesn't take very much to hit the, you know, the sides of that uh, surgeon console. So you, you kept clutching. What I mean by clutching is that the way this works is if I move my hand from here to here, um, the, the machine will move. And then at some point I will hit like, you know, the surgeon console and then I have to push a clutch to reset so I can move again, so I can get more distance. So, you know, it, it involved a lot of clutching. And then the, I think the newer ones, they actually put the clutch in the fingers. So you don't actually have to use your legs to clutch. Um, I'm kind of old school. I still use my leg to clutch on everything. Um, so ergonomic wise, it is better, but it could be, it's okay, but it could be better. Just put it that way. 
Yeah. Do you know you the cost? All these, the... Uh, um, instruments, you know, that you wear over your face, the meta version. Oh, the VR. I, well, that's the, the thing. Is... I see, I see this being merged with a VR set. It won't be 10 years. I, I, I see where it can go. Um, yeah. And and I think the the uh, the the thing about it is that when you use a a uh, when you use a console the first time it's it's very weird but it takes less than twenty twenty minutes after they kind of sitting on it before your brain kind of remasters and says oh I got this and then everything kind of starts working. Naturally, I see with residents all the time. They're like, I've never sat on the console before. I'm like, I know, just sit down, do some practice, and you know. And by the time we start a case, they actually they can actually move things and know how to move the camera. It's like driving, you know, like you know, initially when you're driving, you're thinking, Am I in the like driving a stick shift? Yeah, like, Am I in the first gear? Am I in the second gear? Okay, the sound of the car at some point. You all these things are internalized, and you don't think about it anymore. You, you just kind of depend on your speed and uh, the sound of the car and where you're going. You can tell what gear you're in if you need to downshift or upshift. You know, so that's kind of like how it goes. Does it cause a lot of eye strain? Not not eye. Okay. Not for me. Not eye strain. Neck strain, yes. Shoulder strain, yes. Back <laughs> strain. Um, yeah, that one I, I I work on, like, basically, because it's all about posture. You know, instead of being hunched over, you, if you try to sit straight, the problem with that, that's good for your back. But then your neck goes like this, and then all of a sudden you get that pain. Yeah. So we do have a question. Uh, Frank sets in. Is there a cost difference between robotic versus open? Uh, I bet there is. Uh, and I, I bet it's not um, – I haven't actually – outright looked at the data but as you can see the robotic instrument has a lot of disposables meaning like you know we're using troll cars we're using uh drapes that go over the robot itself uh we're using um um uh you know different instruments that are just a one-time use unlike open surgery where you have a uh a, a, um, a tray that you know you autoclave and sterilize and you could use it a million times and as long as it's still sharp you, you keep going um now where if you're gonna look at it just purely on the cost of operation meaning like a robot versus um uh, uh, open yes robot in my opinion will be I, I will see it being expensive more expensive but if you look at it patient experience wise where uh how long does the patient stay in the hospital Yep. Um, what are the complications the patients have? Um, you know, their pain control. How quickly, you know, did they, did they, did they need rehab? Did they need uh, a lot of things? So if you look at a total care uh, uh, scenario, you will find out that robot is actually cheaper. Because on, on my, at least on my patients, on average, you know, they're going home at day four. You know, they're four to five, they're home. When I did open, two weeks. They were always in the hospital, you know, it was like, it's more like you're waiting for their bowels to wake up. Um, they're not passing gas. They're not ambulating. There's a lot of pain. Um, but with robotic surgery, they're up and about the next day. Uh, there's no drains. I don't put drains like so there's no tubes coming out. The only tubes that come out are the stents from the ilia conduit. Um, I don't put a JP drain. You know, these things that we did when we did open surgery um, that, in my opinion, they cause more pain because think of it if you're a patient and you got a drain sticking out of your skin you know and you have a you have an appliance for say the, the conduit um if you move around everything will hurt you yeah. know patients are also all always happy you, as nurses you guys know this every time you pull a drain they're so happy that that's, <laughs> that came out you know you pull a catheter they're so happy that that came out so anything that would leave less drains perfect another question melanie Ask approximately how long are the ureters clipped? And does uh, it any complication to the kidneys? So the ureters are clipped until we do the uh, anastomosis. So usually I would say, uh, so drop the bladder, do the, the bladder part, do the lymph nodes, give it about two to three hours. And there is no long-term complication to the kidneys, no. 
That's good and it's hear. also advantageous to us because by the time we get to it, they're hydronephrotic and easier to sow. Oh, never thought of that. Yeah. You did get a couple of good compliments. Katie says, excellent presentation. Uh, Janine, excellent presentation, and thank you. So we're getting some great compliments for you, too. Oh, thank you. I know that, you know, radical cystectomy for a while became, you know, almost like not not a an offered procedure and they say it's a lot of times it's because of the amount of work the urologists get involved with post you know I, I took care of all the open cases with our docs um but they said when you figure out the dollars and cents of what you get paid versus how much you have to put into that patient really wasn't a great uh it's, financial it's, return it, it, it's still a big deterrent in the sense that you know like it's a very long and complicated procedure and it doesn't end there. You then have to then follow yeah. the patient, you know, like they're always, you know, like my last cystectomy, you know, everything went well, uh, but then she developed a urine leak and, you know, she had to be, go to IR, get a tube. Now, the great news was she went home quickly, uh, but then, you know, this developed later and then we had to deal with it. Now, when I compare it to my, open, and that's the only, the only reason I still do cystectomies is because compared to what it used to be with open, Robotic, it's it because it's minimally invasive and the patients do so much better. Um, I still do it, but when you look at open cystectomy, a lot of people are not doing them anymore, and they will just rather send them to the academic institutions because mm -hmm. for private practice urologists whose time is um, you know very limited going around on the same patient in the hospital for two weeks straight um, with different complications on different days um, is not something like they like. Um, so, I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't happen with open. It does. Uh, with uh, robotic, it does. But it's just way less. Um, and then there's, you know, we use all this ERIS protocol and ways to actually expedite patients from, uh, prevent patients from staying in the hospital longer. And a big part of it is actually being able to complete the surgery minimally invasively. Uh, because if you reduce pain a lot, then patients are more, I mean, when I finish a robot, the incision that like in the female, the bladder and the lymph nodes and everything, we take it out through that vaginal opening. So there's no incisions here on, on their stomach. So everything is just, you know, taken out through the vagina. In a male, I make a periumbilical incision that is kind of like very, very tiny. And with, from that, because the bladder, once you drain all the urine out, is you know it's like a bag of balloon, but yeah. like, so you could pull it out from a very tiny incision. Um, so it's it's the incisions are so much smaller, and the recovery is 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 much quicker. Yeah, good point. Um, what's your typical follow up then, patients who's had radical cystectomy to monitor for any recurrence? So usually I see them uh, one, like if they go home one week after discharge and then again, two weeks from that. So one week after discharge, then two weeks from that one week visit. And and then I get a scan on everybody like around roughly three months just to see what baseline, you know, like a CT urogram, rescan re everything. So I, I use that as, as my benchmark of knowing, OK, this is how we looked when after you've healed up, everything looks perfect. And then from then on, you know, you, you kind of go into the uh, NCCN guidelines of following patients that have had, you know, cystectomy. So first, every six months, you're getting a scan. And then after a couple of years, you go to every year. Um, now, you have to remember that the same type of tumor that showed up in the bladder can still come in the renal pelvis and uh, in the ureters. Um, so you have to always yearly at least get imaging, you know, like a CT urogram, just to be sure. Doing any cytologies on the urine looking for? Uh, so cytologies are, the, the way I look at it, once the bladder is out, cytologies don't really, in my opinion, like they don't help you that much. If anything, what mm -hmm. they do is they just make life miserable for you in the sense that um, now you've hooked up the bladder to the bowel in a conduit. And the urine that comes out is always going to be, it's kind of like doing a urine culture on somebody that has a conduit. Mm -hmm. It's always going to show something crazy. And if you go chasing it down, you're never, the, the, to me, imaging and doing a lupogram or, you know, a visual look, you know, if there's any, any concerns, um, that's, you know, the thing to do is just to go up there and take a look. 
Um, the uh, other thing is, you know, with the newer tests like the CX bladders and all that, th those to me are actually more useful uh, in mm -hmm. this scenario than just doing a, a good old cytology. Now, I mean, I, I bet there's a bunch of people that disagree, but, you know, I, I think in that scenario, once you remove the bladder, what you're looking for is, is there going to be any recurrence in the upper tract? And if, if there is recurrence, you wouldn't do a nephrectomy or nephroeurectomy based on a cytology. You have to do it based on actually yeah. seeing a lesion. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense. Oh, Can I say, there, go, go ahead, Andrea. Oh, I, I just wondering if you could speak to your enhanced recovery after surgery protocol. So usually, like I said, one of, one of the big things is um, not um, using um, drains. As I try to stay away from drains as much as I can. Both my prostates, my kidneys. The only place I still put drains is partial nephrectomies, and I'm still trying to talk myself out of it. Maybe I will start doing those soon. Um, I try to limit narcotics. So I, ideally, uh, we, we do um, IV Tylenol. Now, there was a time in, in our hospital, for some reason, it was expensive. I, I couldn't figure that one out. Hmm. Um, IV Tylenol was great. So we alternated with uh, IV uh, Toradol uh, around the clock. And we minimized narcotics as much as possible. Like I said, I don't do a bowel prep anymore. Because with the bowel prep, when you wash out everything in the, in the intestine, then you have to wait for the intestine. You know, it goes through a, a phase of diarrhea. Now it wants to like constipate itself and you're now bloated and, you know, waiting forever for it to, to start working. Um, ambulation, we get patients up the next morning. There is no two way. There's, there's absolutely, I don't feel like it. No, you're getting up, you're walking. We're doing this, you know, you're, and the, the, the other thing is like telling patients like, oh, okay, you're going to be going home uh, in three days. Okay. The plan is three days. You're going home. Patients, when you set expectations, actually what my, what I found is that patients actually, um, if you tell them like they're going to go home the next day, um, they know they're going home the next day and they actually are motivated to work towards going home the next day. So you tell them everything that they have to do in order to go home um, and things like that. Um, now there is a, gosh, I'm forgetting the name. It's probably like uh, in my uh, um, uh, preferred list, uh, but there, there are other uh, uh, medications that, you know, we give, I tell anesthesiologists, you know, even when during surgery, I try to limit the amount of pneumoperitoneum I use. Um, if I can drop it down uh, as much as, you know, like sometimes I, I might do the surgery at 10. Uh, uh, pneumo instead of 15 and the theory there is that when you don't distend the bowel uh, sorry the uh, the abdomen as much as possible uh you, what you end up doing is um, kind of maintaining some physiologic uh um uh state that you don't have like air or, or co2 going into you know sub q or other different places that takes some time for that to kind of resolve and Kind of delay your patients going home so when we don't do anything super crazy like it's more of things that we kind of think ahead of time is usually the pain medicine that's that's the biggest achilles heel trying to get everybody on board be it your anesthesiologist be it the the hospitalist and also be the nurse who's on the floor who thinks patient is in severe pain and they don't have any knocks you know there's no morphine ordered for this patient oh yeah i don't do morphine um is IV Tylenol, Toradol, and then if, if, oh, and then, oh, I forgot to say this too. We also do blocks, a tab block, okay? Um, I do tab blocks now. Before tab blocks, I used to use the OnQ pain pump. I don't know if you guys um, mm -hmm. know about that. It's basically, a, a, uh, uh, it's uh, subcutaneous lidocaine, but it's kind of mixed with, I think it's to uh, bupivacaine or whatever they have a cocktail like that's in it basically and it's tunnel under the skin and over the course of two days two to three days it will slowly kind of just drip out um the um the uh local pain medicine and that usually helps with uh, uh pain but since i switched to doing tab blocks i don't think i've seen much of a difference even my prostatectomy i do it on all my patients my prostatectomies uh, my my kidneys and and as well as the the cystectomies and the yeah. nephroeurectomies too. 
that could be almost an interesting talk in its own, just post-op uh, pain control. I, I, I think that's a, a very big part of, um, of kind of like minimal invasive surgery is exp- getting everybody on board to understand that um, narcotics, you know, if you can limit it as much as possible, then recovery is, is much faster, much, much faster. And I'm telling you, uh, you, during COVID, I was sending patients home same day. You know, I would do a prostatectomy. I sent it home the same day because they got a tab block. And even now, I still wonder why I don't send them home the same day because they spend overnight. Um, but we're not really doing anything for them. <laughs> you know, they got a tab block. They get the surgery. Uh, they spend the night. The next morning, they're up. They walk. And I'm like, we'll see you in a week in clinic to take your catheter out. And they go home. Yeah. So it's... it's um, I, I think... You, you know, my wife is an anesthesiologist and we always talk about this. I'm like, we, we kind of underutilize regional anesthetics too. You know, we kind of go for the general um, in a lot of things, but using blocks. I mean, uh, for, my, for my cases, when I do a nephrourectomy or cystectomy, they tap, they block both sides. Um, when I do um, a kidney, they will block just one side. Um, if it's a prostate, they will block usually both sides. Um, so, and, and it works great. I mean, with top blocks, I was sending patients home same day. Like, they wake up and they're like, I don't feel as bad as I thought I would. I'm like, and you're going home with Tylenol number three. Um, lots of, you know, uh, some, um, um, uh, colase and a lot of ambulation. That's it. Yeah. My wife had her knee replaced and it was uh, outpatient. They gave her a block. She was able to walk to the car, get to the house. And the block didn't really wear off for probably a day almost. Yeah. And yeah. put her on Tylenol around the clock. Yeah. Just the 500 milligrams every four to six hours. So the pain never got strong. She never used, never took one narcotic. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, then you don't have the constipation you issue. You don't have the constipation you issue. Don't have, you know, you're not like in la la land. So you're not getting up and walking and doing stuff and breathing and all the other stuff yeah. that lead to those complications. I think it's really a, a great thing. So uh, let's see here. I'm going to just switch over to my other screen. That was our questions and answers. This was a great session, by the way. I really appreciated all the information that we shared today. It was uh, fantastic. I would like to put a plug in for next week. Our own John Lynn is going to be talking about vasectomies. He's the, uh, as, he's, as he's mentioned on programs before, one of the, the largest numbers of vasectomies done in Arizona. So it's going to be interesting <laughs> to hear his tricks. Yeah. But a lot of a lot of blocks yeah. used for that and some yeah. probably distraction therapy. Um, for those of you that are watching and want to just keep the party rolling, there is the after party. You can still go to our website. It's going to be on StreamYard this time. We're not we're getting away from Zoom completely. Um, so you will be able to use your mic, use your video if you want and join us. It's up to you. It still goes on. At this point, I though would like to say thanks to our great panelists here. Couldn't do it without you guys. It's been a great show and really enjoyed uh, hearing more about robotic prostatectomy. Hope someday you might want to join us again for a discussion. Ike, it's, uh, you have a, a yeah. great presentation. Anytime. All right. Great. All right. Have a great day, everybody. For you're not coming to the after party, enjoy your rest of your day. Take it easy now. All right. Thank you.